Welcome to Brainfluence. I'm Roger Dooley. I'm excited to have Paul Zak back on the show today. Paul is the founding director of the Center for Neuroeconomics Studies and professor of economics, psychology, and management at Claremont Graduate University, as well as founder of Immersion Neuroscience. He's been a pioneer in the study of oxytocin, a hormone with a deep connection to trust. His last book, Trust Factor, is one of my favorites. It's a business book based on science, and Paul is the rare academic who understands how business works. In fact, when people ask me the dreaded, what one book have you most often recommended? Trust Factor is my go-to answer. Paul, great to have you back on the show. Thanks so much, Roger. Great to be back with you. Paul, I've been thinking a lot about trust lately. I'm curious, since Trust Factor came out, do you have any new insights about trust, either in business or in general? Yeah, I think we've been looking at some of the precursors to trust. So how do we design um, environment situations so that trust can be sufficiently high? And we found that psychological safety is really the precursor to trust. So if I have low psychological safety, my anxiety is high, I'm just trying to hold on for the next you know, two seconds and I can't actually connect to other people. I'm not a very good colleague. And uh, But being able to measure that in real time physiologically has been, for a lot of companies, um, you know, a real game changer. So I can know right away, at, do I have the preconditions to actually build trust? Right now, Paul, I think we are at a trust inflection point in the U.S. We've just seen the CDC relax their mask guidelines for vaccinated people. And businesses like Costco, Walmart, and others are responding by changing their own mask requirements. In general, the policy is to not require masks for vaccinated shoppers, but they can verify every customer's vaccination status. They're using an honor system. They have to trust their customers because they can't turn their employees into the mask police. At the same time, I'm hearing rumblings from some shoppers that they don't really trust their fellow shoppers. Are they really vaccinated or do they just not like masks? What do you think, Paul? Yeah, I think, you know, we trust is the lubricant, social lubricant around us. So, yeah, we have to have some degree of trust. So we just can't go through life, but also worry about employees. Right. So now if I have a lot of unmasked customers, do I feel comfortable giving great customer service? Am I able to, uh, you know, work in a team with my unmasked uh, colleagues? Um, and so I think, again, that's where measurement comes in. So I'm always going to put my science hat on and go, you know, I, um, I think asking people is important, but also kind of establishing those conditions. So it could be more frequent breaks, um, you know, more uh, chance to wash your hands, um, main, maintaining social distance. I, I, I had a handshake. I told you I traveled last week. I, someone shook my hand. It was so weird. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what am I supposed to have to wash this now? What am I? What's the story? So I think we're all trying to figure this out. And. Uh, I, I do believe tolerance is the important watchword here, right? So we're really, really sensitive that, you know, everyone's anxiety level is going to be all over the map. And, and it's tough. It was, um, you know, it was fun to be on an airplane and fun to be there. But, you know, lift your mask, sip a drink. It's not really, we're not, that's not going to survive. So I think we all have to acclimate to the mask-free lifestyle eventually. Yeah, I had a similar handshake experience, Paul. Just a week or so ago, I met up with a few local colleagues here in Austin and ran into somebody that I hadn't seen in a year and instinctively stuck out my hand. We shook hands. And then I think both of us immediately wanted, oh, gee, <laughs> were we supposed to do that or not? So I think there's probably a lot of that going on around the country. So, Paul, I want to learn more about Immersion Neuro. I know, according to Crunchbase, uh, back in December, you raised a million dollars. So congratulations on that. Uh, and the basic principle seems to be that you are doing in essence, what are something like neuromarketing studies, if you will, uh, using smartwatches. And this is something that uh, I told uh, your uh, colleague, your CEO, that uh, for probably five years or so, I've had a slide in many of my decks that shows a picture of a smartwatch, typically the Apple version, and with something like the future of neuromarketing. Now, <laughs> uh, so far that hasn't panned out. So when I saw your company I said, oh, OK, hey, maybe maybe I was actually right. Can you explain a little bit more about immersion neuro neuroscience, what they do, what the technology is and so on? Right. So we have democratized neuroscience. So this you know, grew out of work in my academic lab in which we identified uh, the signals in the brain that together would tell us how much your brain values that experience. So when the experience is valuable, you'll remember it, you'll act on it, you'll share it. Those are all things that marketers care about. Uh, and so again, we had these you know hundred thousand dollar machines and a room full of PhDs. And as companies started asking us to help them, we kind of realized the problem is 
I'm a weirdo. You don't want to talk to me, right? And I'm, I'm too expensive and I'm too slow. So, you know, we began to automate all the signal processing. Um, and once we did that, we realized, like, why do we need the $100,000 machines? Uh, we've been testing uh, wearables for quite a while. And, you know, 10, 12 years ago, the data quality was pr quite poor. But um, in essence, we have democratized neuroscience by creating a SaaS platform that lets anybody measure what their brain loves in real time, any place people are. So absolutely remote, can be synchronous, can be asynchronous. You can send them a video, send them audio, and actually measure second by second um, how much their brain cares about this. So uh, a lot of our clients are in the um, entertainment space, uh, movies, TVs, TV networks, um, in the training and education space. And one of the great things about uh, um, uh, COVID has been, you know, this kind of explosion of ed tech um, abilities to really capture the best teachers in the world and see if they're really connecting to students. So we have ed tech companies using our technology and certainly the advertising marketing world. Um, Say so we're just sort of throwing spaghetti on the wall and hoping something sticks online. Um, now we can actually test. So we see immersion as workflow software. Um, we have uh, partners that have panels of people with uh, smartwatches with the app already on it. Um, so anyway, that's that's what we really care about is creating extraordinary experiences for customers from advertising to marketing to in-store. Uh, and ultimately, Immersion is designed to be a prediction engine, not a feeling engine. So um, I don't believe in feelings. So think of my poor wife who has to live with me for all these years. Feelings are too fleeting. So what we did when we built Immersion was identified the signals in the brain that told us that people would take an action or highly accurately predictive that people would take an action after a message or an experience and then worked backwards to reverse engineer what these signals were. When you say in real time, Paul, what sort of a time granularity do you have? I'm thinking that your original oxytocin studies were typically a sample before and a sample after when you were doing blood draws, like a sample before some kind of intervention or action or experience, and then after. Uh, obviously, if you're getting continuous data from a wristband of some kind of smartwatch, uh, you don't necessarily have that limitation, but uh, how, you know, how f uh, fine grained is that time understanding? Like if people are watching a commercial or a TV show or a trailer for a movie or something else? Yeah, so we get uh, one second frequency data. So we're getting electrical signals. Um, we actually can get it at higher than one second frequency, but I don't think anybody really needs that. Um, so I, we should say that a lot of the early research was funded by uh, DARPA, by um, uh, different agencies in the US government that, as you can imagine, are interested in predicting what people will do after a communication or an experience. And so U.S. taxpayers uh, were kind to give us uh, millions of dollars to really understand not only the signals coming out of the brain, um, and particularly the signals from the cranial nerves, but we can evolve them in ways that are not natural. So, um, you know, we, we really optimize the combination of signals so that we are able to predict consistently with 80 percent plus accuracy, things like sales bumps from advertising, um, TV ratings for uh, reality TV shows, movie ticket sales, uh, information recall. So that, actually, that's one of the nice things. So there's about a 0.6 correlation between immersion and information recall. So the more immersive you can make this communication or experience or ad, the more people are going to stick this in memory. So one way to think about immersion, which I didn't define, by the way, immersion is a neurologic state in which you're attentive and you're emotionally resonant with the experience. You're sharing the emotions of that communication, let's say. So the attention is dopaminergic. I've got to focus somewhere, but most of the variation second by second in immersion comes from this emotional component. How much do I actually care about this experience? And as you know, Roger, you know, the brain's a, a very energy henry, he, hungry organ. And so um, to get me to care about this is metabolically costly. And so I've got to actually create a narrative. I've got to create some tension. I've got to have a reason to keep watching. Otherwise, I'll just switch off. So just as an aside, we uh, are finishing up some research in my academic lab um, showing that we can predict how long people watch uh, a, a, um, a piece of video as a function of their immersion. So the more immersed they are, the more likely they are to watch it, even though we let them click out anytime they want to. 
Um, so it's really sucking people in. So, you know, think about immersion as like, um, you know, the opening of every James Bond movie that we've ever seen, you know, James Bond running across the, the rooftop and there's some dancehall in distress and he's going to save and bullets are bouncing at his feet. Well, if you watch that, you know, your heart rate goes up, your palms sweat, you start to share the emotions as if you have transported yourself into that movie. And so that's what immersion is capturing is that, that emotional transportation into uh, an amazing, uh, you know, ad or experience or video or movie. So it's a, sort of a, an, an engagement metric, you could say as well, I suppose, that people are actually engaging with the content uh, in emotional or other way. And I, I think that probably there's a good lesson there from James Bond movies. I think everyone since the first couple have used that same approach of having uh, an eye-popping action sequence to start the movie and then went into the titles compared to what it, I think in the early years, the traditional approach was to start a movie with the titles. Who's in it? What's the name of it? Who directed it? Uh, and uh, they kind of broke that mold by uh, both having very unusual animated title sequences, but also starting right with the action before they got to the uh, slower paced title piece. And I, I think that many marketers and content creators could learn from that. Yeah, I totally agree. So we find you've got 15 seconds to get people to care about the experience. If you don't get them in the first 15 seconds, they're generally going to tune out neurologically. Um, and, and the other thing that, that uh, we're, we're seeing clients use, again, this is full self-service. This is a, a game changer because you don't need to see me. You know, it's like a PhD in a chip. It's all in the cloud. And real time was, was hard. It took me a couple of years to, to write really efficient algorithms to be able to do this in real time. But you can watch that data come in uh, whether it's a synchronous event, you know, we're all like right now, uh, or, you know, sending out stuff asynchronously, you guys, that data comes in, it begins to accumulate and you can actually watch it. And it's super weirdly compelling to look at people's brains respond to some content you created or an experience you created. Um, but also it, it allows you to look at the distribution of those individuals. So um, who are the super fans for your experience? And we see clients often find these little golden nuggets where, you know, we thought our target demographic was X, but we find that we have a subset of people in a totally different demographic or demographic or psychographic who are in some area that we really didn't know about. So um, we always recommend that clients, you know, kind of go broad. Even if you think you know your demographic, you may find this little nugget here of people who dig it. And if they're super fans, let them help you. They want to help you. They are turned on by this thing. Uh, encourage them to share on social media and have them invite a friend to your website, whatever that is, you can reward them. You can give them a, a badge, give them a sticker, you know, whether in person or online, send them, you know, what does this thing cost? It cost, uh, I don't know, 50 cents. Send them a sticker. They're super fans, uh, you know, or, or, you know, give them a attaboy on social media. So there's so many ways to keep people engaged when you know how much they care about your experience. That makes a huge amount of sense. And I, I think, too, if you can engage those super fans, even if your whatever content you're creating isn't off to a tremendously brisk start, then sometimes those are the people that can keep it alive long enough for it to catch on. Because I'm sure you know, you, know, you talk about seeing if a TV show will do well in the first 90 seconds. And I, I can see how that would be the case because a lot of people are going to tune out after that. But certainly there are some TV series, uh, particularly uh, scripted series that really start with kind of a slow burn. You know, people take a few episodes to get into it, to know the characters, uh, and then they become uh, fans and draw more people in. So uh, that's great. So, you know, if somebody wants to measure the potential impact of whatever it is they're creating, uh, do they form their own panels of their own customers, their own users, or is this sort of part of a SaaS model where uh, you've got, panels of people who are ready to look at your stuff? Great question. All, all those. So um, again, this is workflow software. So just like you would test anything you're doing, um, a lot of clients in the creative spaces will just, you know, grab some people from the accounting department and go, look, we have some roughs. So we want to show this to you. Uh, you know, we're going to use your wearable or we, we brought a couple wearables. And um, so we find you can get nice directional signals by measuring as few as seven or eight people. Like I have a bunch of roughs. Let's just show them to some folks. So it gets out of that. Well, well, Roger likes this and Paul likes that. And uh, to me, liking is the wrong question, right? I don't really care if you like this. And we've compared liking to immersion and I tell you about that in a second. What I care about, does it stick in your brain so much that you remember it and act on it? That's what we really care about to get a return on, on the uh, investment. 
Um, so we find a zero correlation between liking, self-reported liking, and immersion. Uh, and this is true for Super Bowl ads, it's true for TV shows, on and on and on. So I think the liking question is asking people to reveal their unconscious emotional states. And we just can't do that with any fidelity. So, um, and by having this data second by second, you can, you can begin to edit this. So um, I think liking is the wrong question. Now we do find that highly immersive experiences are enjoyable, but we're going backwards. We're saying, is this tattooing your brain so that it's stuck in there? Um, so again, think, think of the most you know, amazing experience of your life, a birth of a child or a grandchild, you just had a grandchild, uh, you know, um, I don't know, 9-11, right? Those are tagged with emotion. So that's what immersion is picking up is that emotional tagging that says, hey, this is valuable. So it's saved in the brain in a very particular way. Um, and that's why it's so useful for, for advertising, for marketing, for movies. You started off talking about psychological safety and uh, one of the claims on the Immersion Neuro website is that you can actually measure psychological safety or the state that people are in. Uh, explain that a little bit more. Again, that's the kind of the precursor to having a great experience. Uh, trust uh, is a precursor to being immersed. So there's a, a moderate negative correlation between psychological safety and immersion. So again, if I don't have enough bandwidth in my brain because I'm not psychologically safe, I'm just not going to have a great experience or I'm not going to be able to absorb the information in your ad. Um, and so I think we dealt with the first physiologic measure of this, that we can pull data from these cranial nerves and look at arousal levels, essentially. And so if you're over aroused, you just don't have enough space in your brain. Um, by the way, if you're under aroused, again, that, that sort of hot open of the James Bond, if you're under aroused, also immersion is going to be low. So we kind of want you in this middle space. So um, part of the immersion um, secret sauce captures arousal levels. And I do want you to have some reason to, to plug in. But again, most of that variation in immersion is due to this emotional component. So one of our clients, uh, I won't say exactly what he said, but he said, oh, this is a give a give a S measure. I said, yeah, well, that's that's basically what we're capturing is how much does your brain care about this this thing? And um, and, 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 you know, caring is hard. I mean, metabolically is hard. Right. So um, I think on content creators, on uh, event organizers, on trainers, all, all those are asking the human brain to, to put a lot of energy into something that you want them to do that they may not have capacity to do because they're not psychologically safe or they're tired or, or the content just not that good. Um, so I know, uh, Roger, we've talked about this a long time, but you know, the whole arc of my career has been creating tools so that people live happier lives. And no one wants, you know, a, a bad educational experience, a bad training. They don't want to watch bad ads that, you know, um, bad movies. Oh, it's terrible. You, we, you watch the movie trailer and you go, really? They spent $50 million on this dog. Like I can watch the trailer and tell you this thing's no good. So it, it shocks me that in this age of, you know, human evolution that we don't know a good story from a bad story. But I think the reason for that is we're using this biased measurement technology called our own brain and body. And so once we actually can do this objectively, well, now, you know, get, get rid of the stuff that's not good fast and, you know, speed up production of those things that really are to create amazing experiences for uh, clients and customers. You mentioned cranial nerves. Now, ex explain more or less, uh, how does a consumer device on your wrist measure activity in your cranial nerves? Right. So because we had these millions of dollars from the U.S. government, we measured central and peripheral nervous system activity uh, simultaneously. So then we uh, used uh, pharmaceuticals. So we actually can can activate these pathways and we can do a mapping from the areas in the brain that are associated with the attentional response and this oxytocin driven emotional response and then find that mapping from the, the cranial nerves into the head. So we do high density EEG or fMRI. You know, you're getting locations, but you're not getting networks. This stuff is networked. And since the, the brain controls the heart, largely controls the heart, we can take feed and heart rate and then infer via mathematics, you know, what is actually going on in the brain. So um, that, you know, Roger, I'm telling you as if I knew what the hell I was doing five or 10 years ago. And it, it was a lot of experimentation. We just try this over and over and over. And uh, almost all this is published. So um, everyone should be skeptical. I, I'm a skeptic by, by personality and by training as a scientist. Um, you can put me in Google Scholar, download papers, read them for yourself. So almost all the details of this are, are published. The way we actually created these algorithms and the you know, stuff on the website, uh, that's not published. But everything else, you can, you, know, you can look at it and judge for yourself.
Yeah, you mentioned how quickly you can form conclusions about TV shows and such. Uh, on the website, there's one uh, that 90 seconds were about as predictive as much longer segment. Are there cases where a more lengthy uh, process makes sense, where maybe you do have to observe uh, immersion, if you'll call it that, for you know, 30 minutes or 60 minutes or something like that? Yeah, it's a great question. It depends on the, the um, you know, the client use. So I think in the movie industry, we certainly have clients that measure the entire movie. And then, for example, for roughs, so you're beginning the editing process, um, they'll do things like table reads. So we've actually got, I've seen interesting data on doing a table read for a script, uh, which is super cool. And you can actually see where immersion, uh, you know, goes up and down. So um, again, it's really workflow software. Um, and so, you know, uh, sometimes you want to measure the whole event. Uh, but yeah, this kind of short uh, questions were, were, that was a client, like, hey, do we need to watch the whole movie or the whole TV show? Um, could we just do a, you know, a minute, minute and a half? I'm like, that's a damn good question. So the beautiful thing about democratizing neuroscience is there are zillions of interesting questions that I can't think of that clients, you know, will engage with us on. And because it's self-service, they can measure as much as they want. Um, you know, it's, it's a Sanders subscription software. So you subscribe, go to town. Uh, and, and some of the most interesting experiences I've seen honestly have been in classrooms. So pre COVID, uh, we have a bunch of students, a bunch of clients in the educational space and, you know, to, to see, um, teachers looking at this data in real time and helping their class pivot towards more immersive experiences or knowing when they need a break by finding those kids, I call them super fans, finding those kids who love this class and can be discussion leaders. I mean, there's so many ways we can improve the experiences that we all have in the world. Um, but I think that what's been missing is easy measurement. And so that's what we try to do is easy onboarding. Uh, people go to the website, they can try it for free. So maybe I'm full of crap. Maybe it's possible. Um, probably not, but you know, uh, so try it and see if it works for you. If it, if it creates value, awesome, sign up, subscribe, get more features. Um, so we really want to, you know, I'm passionate, as you know, about just creating better experiences for everybody in the world. One of your case studies is TED Talks. And I guess they're a good tool because you can see how popular they are and yeah. they're easily available for use as samples. And how, I don't know if you looked at uh, how long you, how much of a TED Talk you had to watch before uh, you could predict that it would be a highly viewed viral one or maybe not so much. Yeah, I, we didn't do that for that study, although that's a good, another good question that we could do because we have all the data. But we, yeah, we found uh, a 10% increase in immersion for a TED Talk resulted in 170,000 more online views. So, you know, the size effects are really large for immersion. If you can get people to really get into your talk, um, yeah, it, it's going to pay off. So again, apply that to CEO presentations or, um, you know, conference presentations. Um, really, if you want to have an impact, um, you can guess, I would say hope's not a strategy, but measurement is. Right. Well, Paul, you and I both do some public speaking and training, and I had a vision of some guy in a dark booth at the back of the room having maybe a dozen members of uh, the audience wearing smartwatches uh, talking into my ear saying, OK, Roger, you better change it up. You're losing him. Uh, or maybe just telling the MC, OK, uh, get that doofus off the stage. Uh, the audience isn't paying any attention at all. Is uh, uh, that's obviously uh, an exaggerated example, but would something like that be possible? Yeah, I, I think two ways. One, I think our clients in the events organization space use immersion to train people to be better keynotes. So rehearsal, right? So um, when I spoke at TED, um, I had about 10 months to prepare, but it was doing this. It was, you know, by Zoom and then I did some rehearsal in person. And, you know, it was people giving me opinions, but why not have objective data? Like, did I really capture them? Was my big reveal in TED, you know, um, uh, exciting enough? Um, so that's the first. I think the second is one of our longest term clients has been Accenture. that has been using our platform uh, to optimize the training. They spend a billion dollars annually to train their employees, future proof their employees. That's amazing investment. But they never had a great measurement technology. So what Accenture has found is um, what I'm calling the 2020 rule, that's my term, not theirs, which is no matter how good a speaker you are or I am, Roger, people cannot stay immersed for more than about 20 minutes. And so they break up their training into 20 minutes of presentation, 20 minutes of 
participatory learning, so having those learners do something, and then 20 minutes of debrief. And they've also found that breaks are really important. So the, uh, one of the learning architects at Accenture had a great phrase. Let me see if I can get it right. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy always wins. So if your butt hurts, if you have to pee, if you know, you, you just, again, your psychological safety is lower, your bandwidth to learn is reduced. And so they're putting in actually longer breaks. So after an hour, they do like a half an hour break. And that seems weird, right? Because you see like, we're adults. Uh, they found, for example, the working lunch, terrible. Uh, in that people people need a break actually, and so not only were working lunches very low immersion, but it carried over to the session after lunch. So people just need a, a cognitive break, um, and so shorter, more intensive, more repetition. I think is what we're seeing as important. Um, and so again, I think you you know apply the same thing to to advertising. Um, great stuff. Let me see it a bunch of times, stick that in my brain, and then I'm likely to remember it. And when I go into the store or search online and I see that logo, oh yeah, those guys, that was a great ad. Could this technique be used to evaluate physical products? Yeah, we have a client, uh, a, a big electronics uh, maker that is actually doing that in their testing facility in Europe. Um, so yeah, they have people come in, they have a beautiful lab, and they have people uh, use those products. Um, and so you have cameras all around the room and you can just overlay, actually the, the immersion platform will automatically overlay the immersion data with what they're using. Um, and there are other ways to do that. You can show them aspects of the product via video if you want to do it asynchronously. Um, yeah, work great. And uh, e even live events, you know, um, we went with, I took my team to Disneyland just before, before COVID, just for fun. And we all wore smartwatches and we looked at you know, standing in line. You know, Disneyland is so famous for having these wonderful experiences as you're waiting to get onto that, uh, you know, attraction. And uh, what we found is that not only was Disneyland in the you know 98th percentile for immersion, but sometimes the 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 path through there was actually more immersive than the ride itself. So Disney has done a really a great job at capturing uh, people's emotional state so that they're fully engaged in the whole process of getting on the attraction and on riding it. Do you think there's a possibility or value in uh, combining the smartwatch or wristband readouts with other techniques like either eye tracking, perhaps, or facial coding? Yeah, facial coding pretty much has been blown out of the water academically. It just doesn't predict the outcomes at all. So um, I think no one's really doing that much anymore. Um, yeah, we have a couple of clients that have done uh, with eye tracking. So again, I think the... Um, uh, the eye tracking gets you visual attention, but it doesn't tell you about the, the valence, the emotional state. So I may look at something because I'm just confused or unhappy or because I really love it. And so um, immersion allows you to differentiate those two. Um, so cer certainly for, uh, for online experiences, um, knowing where the eye is going is pretty important. So what is the next step? Something that uh, you can't do now, but hope to be able to do in the either not too distant or maybe a little, little bit farther out future. Yeah, I think it's really, uh, uh, you know, curating your entire life uh, for, for greater happiness. So we have a number of clients that are building emotional wellness uh, uh, platforms that are using data from our wearable uh, to capture what do you love in life? Uh, and so um, and particularly looking at more vulnerable populations. Um, so imagine if you're doing this all day and, and you know, it could be at work, like, what do you love doing at work? Well, you're going to put more discretionary effort in. It's just human nature. And, you know, what frustrates me at work? It's hard for me to articulate that, particularly to my boss. But if we agree to share data and they go, man, I love accounting. I'm just, I, I didn't know. It's just great. And then meeting with clients, not so much. So, you know, either train me on that or give me more of that. But more generally, you know, what, what the big arc of, you know, my career and hopefully the company is, is just helping you figure out what really drives your happiness so you can live a more fulfilled life. And then, you know, if you can avoid those things that, that, you know, are neurologically frustrating where you're, you're, you're doing them, but you just don't care about it. Um, and so I think having that quantified self knowledge about your emotional states really is the next frontier. So we want immersion to be the new steps. So steps was really cool for the 20th century, how much are you moving, but knowing what you really care about that to me is the future. Well, I think making people happier is an awesome goal and probably a pretty good place to wrap up, Paul. How can people find you and your ideas online? Uh, easy to find me. Uh, it's get immersion with an I, getimmersion.com. You can go on there and get a free trial and uh, use it yourself. And if it's great for you, awesome, subscribe. Uh, and if not, then hopefully it was uh, amusing for a couple of weeks.
Uh, we will link there and to any other resources we spoke about on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast, where we will have video, audio, and formatted text versions of this conversation. Paul, thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much, Roger.